I'm excited that we have John in the house tonight. Um, he is certainly um, a great activist for open science as such. And more originally, he studied in London at the Imperial College, I think, Earth Science and Engineering. That's what his PhD was about. He even got an award, John, um, Janet Watson Award. Um, but um, actually, he didn't stay much longer in this institution. Um, rather than that, he went a little bit rogue and started all of his own private projects. Um, so he spent a lot of time on the road traveling, speaking, um, activating the community around open science. Um, he started the Open Science MOOC and also the um, Paleo Archive, if that's pronounced correctly. Yes, perfect. Um, so he really is one of um, the great voices for open science. Um, we'll hear him talk for around 15 minutes and then um, we can engage with him in a discussion with questions and everything that you want to learn and, or ask him. Yes, welcome on stage, John. Thanks for that um, introduction. Uh, so welcome class of 2019, I guess. Um, this is a bit of an emotional talk for me to give, actually, tonight. So, um, you know, like uh, Zach just said, I've done a, given a lot of talks about open science before. But tonight, this one's a bit special because, firstly, uh, it's at Wikimedia. It's, uh, I've got a group, lot of great memories here with many of you here. Uh, but I'm also leaving Berlin tomorrow after four years here, and um, my journey is continuing. So. You know, I could have given like a generic talk about how awesome open science is and you know why open access is fantastic and Plan S is going to change the world and why we all need to share data. But I decided to instead talk about the sort of cultural revolution that's happening around the world that you're not just part of, but all of you here in this room are beginning to sort of drive at the moment. So I chose a bit of a cryptic title here. Does anybody know which movie this line is from? Okay, well, it's from Batman the Dark Knight Rises. And uh, at the beginning of the movie, at the beginning of the revolution, somebody asked Bane, the bad guy, he's like, have we started a fight? And he's, have we started a revolution? So hopefully at the end of this talk, I'll convince you that we have. And that there are major challenges still that we have to really appreciate and overcome within this space. So, you know, to start with, I figured I'd try and get you all a little bit angry. You know, this is um, what a typical British man being angry looks like. We just drink tea and pretend that the world is okay. So, you know, a simple fact is that the vast majority of scholarly research and knowledge is not owned by the public, it's not owned by the scientists who create it, but it's in fact owned by private companies such as Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, and all of these, these bad boys. The outcome of this is that essentially research is not being used to, in the way that it should be, and this disadvantages pretty much everyone on the planet, including us here, um, and the only people who can really benefit from it you know, even at a great expense, are those who are in very wealthy or elite institutes, such as the one I'm from. Um, and these, these scholarly publishers, hopefully I don't need to tell you this, you know, they're, they're pretty shit. Okay, you know, Elsevier have a profit margin of 35%. Spring and Nature do too. Um, you know, they extract money from the public purse uh, through a business model based on knowledge discrimination, and then we sell that knowledge back to the public. And this really makes me a little bit annoyed. And the consequence of this is that we're not using research, we're not communicating research effectively, and you know, our world is suffering as a result of this. So, who here has heard of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals? Yes, good, this is the most that's ever got up in an audience ever. You know, this includes things like just having a high quality education, you know, very fundamental. These are things which we basically need to save the planet, right? You know, taking action against climate change, saving life on land and the water from the ongoing biodiversity crisis or sixth mass extinction right now. So my question to you all is, like, do you believe that scientific research can help us to either solve or mitigate these problems? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jared. <laughs> totally not planted at all. <laughs> so, you know, the act, oh, ye, yes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the answer is always yes, otherwise why are you here? Um, but then at the same time, we have to acknowledge that the way in which we're communicating science at the moment, you know, beholden to these big private corporations, we're actually actively acting against meeting these goals. And you know this is you know this is the process which is sort of all locked into at the moment. This is sort of like what the open science rebellion is against. It's saying actually you know we're not communicating research effectively, and you know this industry is extracting money and selling our work back to us. And you know it's not a bug. It's not just happening once or twice a day. This is a systemic feature, um, and it's really bad actually. So this is where whatever open science is comes in. Um, you know open science is often heralded as 
the solution to all of our problems, the solution to the cereals crisis, the solution to the reproducibility crisis. I ask anyone of you in this room, and you'll give me a completely different, different definition of what open science is. Um, that's one of the best ones, though. So if you want to actually read a systematic review about what open science is, it says open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. You can't read that, though, because Elsevier is paywalled. Like, the irony is, is overwhelming. It's not funny. <laughs> okay, it is. <laughs> um, then there's a brilliant editorial, though, from Mick Watson in Junior Biology back in 2015. And he said something very similar. He said, open science describes the practice of carrying out scientific research in a completely transparent manner and making the results of that research available to everyone. You know, isn't that just science? You know, you have to ask yourself, you know, then what's the opposite of open science? If we're not sharing the research, it's all locked behind paywalls, we're not making it available to everyone it's completely unreproducible, then is that even really research? So there's a bit of a problem with that. But you know, those definitions are both very pragmatic. They're focused on the process and the practices that researchers engage with on a sort of daily basis. But very rarely do we actually address the sort of underlying philosophy behind research and you know, the very human elements behind it. So this is a great slide from uh, a good friend, Tony Ross Hallower. And he talks about the principles of open scholarship. And it includes things like inclusivity, responsibility, equality, having knowledge as a public good, you know, and all of these sorts of things. But as well as that, there are sort of human values which, f which sort of fit into this. So freedom, fairness, justice, truth, and liberty are just several of these. And I'd like to think that each of us in this room are actually good enough humans that we believe that freedom and truth are good things, you know. Um, I think there's even a Moulin Rouge song about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but like this is, this is sort of where the principles and the values really come into play, because I, I feel like this is definitely a thought in progress, and I'd love to hear some thoughts on this. But like for me, you know, if you have values such as equity, freedom, and fairness, and you have principles like reproducibility, accountability, and transparency for your research, and this is for you as a human, then those are just things which define us as good people and things which define good science or good research. And this is what open scholarship is all about. It forms this sort of continuous feedback loop where you know, these common practices, which we're all probably hopefully very familiar with by now, like open access and sharing data, become intrinsic. And you know, even if we abide by the practices, then it means that we're automatically sort of abiding by the values of open science. And it's just this sort of intrinsic loop. So if you believe in things like freedom, fairness, and equity, then you're automatically an open scientist, as far as I'm concerned. Or, alternatively, as you just saw, you know, open science is just science done right. This is what Rick is saying. Uh, not Rick, Rick, sorry. And you know, in two, three, four, five years' time, I want to stop using the word open science because it's just a sort of tautology in a way. You know, science without open is just anecdotes, is, is another saying. Um, so yeah, that all sounds probably very ideal. So what's holding us back? Does anybody recognize who this is without reading on the bottom? Okay, he's a British MP, so I don't blame you. Uh, this is the late Tony Benn. He was a very powerful politician in the UK uh, a few decades ago. And he was a big campaigner for fundamental democracy in the UK. And one of his most famous speeches, he said, he got up in Parliament, um, in the House of Commons, and he said, what we need to do is ask the five powerful questions. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interests do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how do we get rid of you? <laughs> and, and I love this quote. And then he finished it off with this beautiful sentiment. He said, only democracy gives us that right. That is why no one with power likes democracy. And that is why every generation must struggle to win it and keep it, including you and me here and now. And this was back in 2005. And this is directly relevant to what we're doing now. Because, like I mentioned before, you know, we are stuck in this sort of power uh, like struggle at the moment with particular actors in this space. And again, I'm going to do some beautiful publisher bashing here, um, because I really don't like them. <laughs> but like, you know, has anybody not heard of Elsevier? Hopefully you all know who they are. They're like the big bad boys. Um, you know, these big scholarly publishers, they still talk about journals and papers. You know, these are products that were developed in the 17th century before we even thought about the internet. And it was the business practices of these companies which essentially catalyzed whatever the open science movement or community is. The business models are not things that I imagine any of us here for, like, actually agree with on sort of any level. They're based on things like knowledge exclusion. You know, if you, if you can't pay, you can't play. They exploit privilege, they exploit the public purse. It's based on knowledge discrimination, again, like, you know, if you can't afford to have access to this knowledge, even though it might save your life, tough titties. Um, sorry, tough luck, sorry, that's an English expression. And, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not great, really. Um, but then, at the same time, you see things like this. If you type in Elsevier and Open Science now, 
They say on their website, Elsevier partners with the research community to empower open science. If you go and look on the lobby register here in the EU, it says Elsevier lobbies on behalf of the open science community. And it's just like, are you kidding? Like, they're paying lip service to, um, to open science while simultaneously subverting it to meet their own needs. And, you know, the values and the principles I mentioned before, I'm pretty sure that as a business, they do not share that. So when I see things like this, it, again, it makes me very English and angry. And it's like, what the fuck is that? Like, why aren't we challenging this? Why are Elsevier allowed to get away by stealing our narrative that we're trying to create and fundamentally corrupting whatever open science is? And it's not just Elsevier as well. You know, Spring and Nature, the, I think they have offices just around the corner from here, which you go and say hello. You know, they tried to go public last year. They had an IPO, it failed because of the work which many of us here are doing. Huh? Um, but, you know, in their prospectus, you know, there was this, this is just a selected quote. They said, we aim at increasing article processing charges for open access by increasing the value we offer to authors through improving the impact factor and reputation of our existing journals. This is like the most anti-open science thing that they could write. And when they were called out for that, they said, ooh, you weren't supposed to read that. That was, you know, a prospectus for potential investors. So they're trying, basically trying to lie. And they wrote this thing, Spring of Nature is committed to being part of the open access movement. And it's like, no, they're really not, because, again, they do things like this, and this is not what open access is all about. So when they do that, yeah, it's like, how about no? Um, but they're still doing this on a daily basis. They're, they're sending out propaganda, they're corrupting open access, they're corrupting open science. This was just a couple of weeks ago, on May the 10th, Spring of Nature proposes a model for open access transition. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to be the leaders of the open access movement. <laughs> The gall, the audacity of the statements they were saying was just outrageous. You know, this is Mr. Inchcombe, uh, I don't even know what his job title is, like editor-in-chief of Spring of Nature or something. I don't care. And he said, we respect academics, but it's becoming increasingly clear that unless we can move from being a passive enabler, you know, Springer, those people have been helping us so much to achieve open access, and every, you know, a passive enabler for academics and researchers to make their choices, to being a driver of open access, the transition is going to happen at a snail's pace. And like, I don't know what sort of mental gymnastics this idiot is doing. It's like his company has been blocking open access and lobbying against open access for the last two decades. And when he's like, actually, you know, it's the academic's fault and we're going to come along and save the day. <laughs> so thankfully, um, you know, the researcher who was in charge, it's not the researcher, the editor who was in charge of this piece was like, yeah, I'm not really comfortable publishing a lot of this. Can you give me like a counter view? And I did. And I said, spring of nature of a definition of bandwagon jumpers. They've been dragged kicking and screaming into the open access space. <laughs> And it was quite funny. So like, there was this propaganda, and then at the end of it was like, actually, it's pretty much bullshit. Um, but the thing is, all of us need to be doing this more often. Okay? You know, these guys have humongous marketing departments and marketing power. And you know, we all need to be very much aware of this. We need to be combating this propaganda when it happens. And it, oh, Jesus Christ, what the fuck happened there? Springer on the, on the loose. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and you know, it gets sort of worse and worse the more you sort of know about it. So who's heard of the Open Science Monitor? So who's providing data for the Open Science Monitor? Elsevier. Elsevier are literally helping to govern the future of open science now in the EU. The European Commission are paying Elsevier to monitor you all and the progress of, uh, of, of open science here. It's absolutely bonkers. So I was invited to write a piece about this in The Guardian. Um, and, you know, I basically said Elsevier are corrupting open science in the EU, which is by and large true. You know, the fact that um, they, are, they stand to benefit commercially from uh, the sort of thing. Uh, they're basically using their, their own services and tools because, you know, they're the only ones involved in open science apparently. And, you know, we, we sort of took them to town and it was really good fun. It went pretty viral. But, you know, Elsevier and the Lisbon Council who they're working with on this, they got really pissed off. And it was fantastic. They both wrote these smear pieces about me and those... Others who are involved in it basically saying, well, you know, they're just using Twitter and social media to whip up a mob, and you know, everything they say is completely untrue. Um, you know, so it's an ad hominem attack, very, very fundamental, very easy, but it was a great way to test the water. So eventually, I wrote back to them and said, uh, this is the TLDR version. You know, I'm going to need you to shift your opinions way up uh, inside of you, <clears throat> and said, you know, unless you choose to engage with me on, you know, a sort of fundamentally professional level, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And um, while this is all happening. We put in a formal complaint to the European Commission saying, what the bloody hell do you think you're playing at? You know, Elsevier is sort of corrupting open science, you know, all, all these very obvious things. And um, they took it seriously, it was really nice. So Jean-Eric Paquet, I think he's the Director General, Director General for, uh, 
science in the European Commission, you know, they said, we'll look into it, we'll do an actual formal investigation. And they did. Um, but they basically said, everything is fine. You know, don't worry, you know, Elsevier are okay. You know, they're, they're not going to do anything bad with this. Um, they didn't address any of the actual sort of really deep issues which we mentioned, such as like the actual, what Elsevier were doing, were they good, you know, what's their role within this open science monitor, and the fact that they were only using their own data sources for all of this stuff, the, the conflict of interest inherent in this. But one thing which did result from this is that there's now an independent advisory group who are overseeing Elsevier and the Open Science Monitor. And it includes people like Jason Prune, Heather uh, Biwawa, Cameron Nail, and all people who are basically going to say everything that you're doing is unacceptable. You're not, and like essentially going to shut down the Open Science Monitor just because that's how it should be. But all of that was really just a test. So, you know, the whole idea was to provoke Elsevier into sort of responding in public. And they did, and they made fools of themselves. It was fantastic. So while they were doing that, myself and Bjorn Grams, who I think hopefully many of you know here, we decided to go a step higher and report Elsevier and Relics to the European Competition Authority for complete marketplace corruption. And the fact that there was no even market emerging around scholarly or scientific publishing because of the practices of Elsevier and others um, in this space. And brilliantly, at the same time, the European University Association, so you know, pretty big in this space, they decided to get involved too, and within two weeks, the European Commission received two formal complaints about marketplace corruption uh, and Elsevier's role in this. And we were like, yes, finally, something is going to happen. You know, this is big momentum. Elsevier couldn't make a single public statement about this because everything which we said was factually correct. But the European Commission actually just said, again, honey, you know, it's not a problem. It's not our problem. Someone else will fix it. They, they literally said, Plan S is going to solve everything, as will the European Open Science Cloud. And we sort of you know, we got given the middle finger, essentially. Both of us did, the European University Association did too. We got a little paragraph of text saying, not our problem, someone else will fix it. Um, so the result of this was that, you know, we really actually, in Europe or at least, we can't rely on politicians and policymakers to get us out of this mess. You know, Elsa, they're in co here to stay, and they're not going to help. There is no sort of white knight consortium who's going to come and save us from this problem. It's actually up to people like us in this room and those of, uh, you know, our friends and our colleagues. But, you know, taking a lesson from Michael Jackson, you know, we're not alone in this, <laughs> okay, it's not just me, it's not just Chris, it's not just Joe who are fighting this battle, you know, you're not just a group of fellows, you're part of a community, and that's really important, and it's not just, again, the people in this room, it's the communities which you're all part of, which all sort of intersect and overlap, and, you know, things are changing really, really fast at the moment, so another thing I was working on for the last couple of years was getting, again, this is cut off really annoyingly, um, I was working with an organization called Education International, this is sort of like the World Health Organization of education around the world. And they essentially called me up to Brussels one day and said, John, can you basically give us ammunition to hurt Elsevier? And I was like, yeah, okay, sure, I can do that. <laughs> so they were like, we have 32 million members. Most of them are librarians, education specialists in higher education and further education, and researchers. And they were like, we can actually you know, hurt them pretty big, and they've done it before. Um, and this is what we did. And you know, the, the general, secretary, gen, general Secretary of EI, he basically said, right, what we're going to start doing is contacting unions all around the world, education and library unions, and saying, you know, this is information which we now have about how to systematically challenge Elsevier. And you've probably heard a lot of the news recently, like Norway, Sweden, Taiwan, all of these countries have been taking a big stand, right? Huh, I wonder if it has anything to do with this. Like the unions and people behind the scenes have been really pummeling hard against Elsevier and Australian nature. And for good reason, it's because David, again, the, the leader of e Education International, he's a pretty principled man. He said, you know, higher education and research are fundamental social rights, and as such must be exempt from commercialization by third parties, which are only interested in making profit, not in promoting access to knowledge. And we have to democratize knowledge if we want to achieve social justice through quality education. And, you know, he said, we've got the full power of Education International behind us. And it was fantastic. So there's a lot happening right now. There's a really global sort of revolution happening right now. But maybe that all sounds a little bit negative, you know. This is like the scare tactics. So I'll take a, a little uh, page from one of my heroes, uh, this guy Don Draper from Mad Men. And <laughs> he once said, if you don't like what is being said, then change the conversation. So flipping that round, it's like, what can we actually achieve? You know, the people here in this room, the people who we know, through active training, support, and greater communication as a community. And this is one of the things I've been working on for the last year. Again, uh, the Open Science MOOC, which was mentioned, it actually stands for Massively Open Online Community. Uh, Chris, Joe, and others here are helping me to, to build this. And we have a very simple mission. It's to help make open the default setting for all global research. Um, 
but not doing it just through practices, but through principles and values. We want to create a welcoming and supporting community, which we have been doing pretty well, I think, but with good tools, teachers, and role models, but built upon the solid values-based foundation of free and equitable access to research. Um, and yeah, this is what I'm spending a lot of my time sort of doing on the moment, and that's why I'm moving to Paris tomorrow to work on this. And um, yeah, we're live, you know, it's, there's a real community vibe to it in terms of just people chatting with each other and, and learning from each other. But as well as that, there is like an online platform that has videos, tools, uh, tasks and things where people can learn new knowledge and new skills to empower themselves to become better researchers, to solve the problems um, which are inherent to the sort of modern research society. But we go a little bit deeper as well. We talk about things like the open principles and values because we believe that this is fundamental to whatever open science is. Um, and the question, which I, I sort of love this, is like, instead of you know, fragmenting ourselves across silos, um, what can we all actually achieve if we stand together? So this doesn't have to end here tonight. Like, you can keep this going every day for the rest of your life if you want, as a community. And we need to do this really big, because, uh, really importantly, because you know, these are big fights which we're having in our time right now, big problems which our society is facing. And we need to stand together as a unified and global community, you know, not just here in Germany, you know, everywhere. Um, and make sure that what we're all doing is acting in the best interest of the public and not corporate gains. And this is bigger than any single one of us. And this is why we need to act together, to support each other, to communicate with each other, to learn from each other, and to grow together as a community to really make sure that what we're doing is we're prioritizing society and the people who comprise the society over the private profits of just a few greedy corpor ah, corporations, which it is. And, you know, but this is talking about, like, cultural change now, right? You know, it's not easy. Like, that's, that's for sure, you know, people have been working in this space for a lot longer than I have, and it's not easy. But, like, fundamentally, I think one of the things we've been missing is this real sense of community. We need better education, training, and support. And this is what, again, we're working on. And then you can sort of, like, take a sort of stepwise approach to changing culture from that. We need to empower people like you, people younger than you, to become leaders for the next generation. You know, this is about sustainability of a new research culture. And once you start to do this, we can start to shift these negative power dynamics to reduce bias and abuse within the academy. Like the current research culture around the world is one of the most toxic research like uh, work environments in the world. Like 50% of PhD students leave their PhD or graduate from their PhD with a mental health problem, and it's because of these bloody like problems which we all have, just trying to compete with each other just to get published with one of these commercial entities. It doesn't make any sense. But the way we can get past that is by helping to build this global community based on values. Like values, not practice. You don't become friends with someone because they share data. You become friends with someone because you share something in common, like a, you know, a fundamental value of some sort. But the big problem is, as I'm sure I don't really need to tell you, it's like we need massive scale engagement to realign open science with current incentive structures. So death to the impact factor, essentially. Whoops, it is. This is not good. And, you know, cultural change is not easy. You know, we don't teach as much social science in paleontology, but they, there are certain things which I sort of do know. And, you know, what we need is we need active leadership from those who are less at risk. So is anybody here like a professor or a tenured professor? Right, you know, this is your responsibility, more than the rest of us, okay? Because you have less risk than those of us who are still trying to, like, figure out our way in life. You need to invest in our future and stop protecting the status quo. Stop protecting, you know, the capitalist structures which are creating all of these problems and make sure that the system that we're all creating together is in the best interest of future generations. I already, I'm, I'm only 31, I already feel outdated. Like, I want to be protecting the undergraduates and the people who are like going through high school, and making sure that the, if they want to come to university, there's going to be a thriving culture there for them, not just for whatever I want. And part of this is, again, down to individuality. It's like for each one of us, again, in this room, to take small steps where we can, but without putting ourselves at risk. Like, this is really important. Like, if you feel that practicing something or preaching something within the open space is going to put you at risk, best not to do it, okay? But the best thing you can do is empower yourself to be aware of the options which are available to us. So this is new skills and new knowledge, um, which we can use to, you know, empower ourselves so that we can empower those around us. But sometimes we also have to be a little bit brave. This is not for everyone, and I, I don't, like, this is like a half recommendation. It's like, if you ever feel like this is getting way too frustrated, it's t it's sometimes it is time to stand up for what you believe in. Like, in Berlin, there have been protests, so many protests over the last few weeks about climate change, saving the biodiversity crisis, and all of this stuff. There are protests happening right there today. People are standing up for what they believe in. And they're asking the challenging questions, and they're challenging those who are creating these problems as well. And it's, it's really sort of um, inspiring in a way. And, you know, individually, again, you know, one little thing which I would ask is just for each of us to be deeply introspective of what we want from ourselves, what we want from science, and what we want to achieve. Um, 
And you know, these aren't easy things, they're fairly difficult, but they're definitely worth doing. And you know, the sort of ultimate goal, this is sort of my vision of where I want to be five years ago. <laughs> it's like, what we need to do <laughs> is pool all of our knowledge and resources to create a decentralized scholarly infrastructure with communities as the focus. And you know, by communities I mean based around principles and values of good science and good people. So again, inclusivity, equality, accountability, freedom, fairness, justice, truth, rigor, transparency, reproducibility. All of these really good things. And really embed them in what we're doing on a sort of daily basis. And if we do that, then we can actually do this little thing here, which is science is a public good for the betterment of society. And we can actually start using science to guide these sustainable development goals and actually sort of mitigate these problems which we face as a global society. So the last slide now. So the first slide was, um, have we started a fire? So anybody who has seen that movie, they'll know that Bane then responds to the guy, says yes, and the fire rises. And what he means is that they've started the revolution. The revolution, the open science revolution is on. It's happening right here, right now with all of you. And you know, I figured my final words in Berlin about open science should be those of someone who inspires me every day. And it's this chap, Aaron Schwartz. Hopefully most of you know him. And one time he said, what is the most important thing that you could be working on in the world right now? And if you're not working on that, then why aren't you? Let's take a bit of time for questions and discussion, no? Um, <laughs> maybe if you want to be a bit more comfortable, we can bring a chair to you on stage. I'm good. Okay, like this, because then the last rows can see you better. Uh, otherwise, they don't see you anymore. Um, and I'll just jump around for questions. So, who wants to go? Yes, comment, questions, ideas. Thanks. Um, I'm Toby. Thanks, John. Um, this was a fantastic talk. I think there was a lot of great size and material in there. Um, and I think it's also a really motivational message, you know, to say you're not alone, we're a great community, we can build this together. But um, sort of as someone who has already tried this for some years, let's uh, talk about this a bit more pragmatically. How can we actually make this work as a community? Because what I see a lot are two problems. So one is like insular thinking, really, that um, people, for example, want to advance open science and they write a great editorial in a locked-in Elsevier journal about that, sure. right? So that's, that's what I see a lot. Uh, people partnering up with Elsevier and so on to promote their insular area of open science, yeah. So, and the other thing is this sort of neutrality. So we say, oh yeah, we want to be equal, we don't embrace certain products or whatever, so everybody on this platform is going to be equal, but I think that through that we often miss out on really supporting community initiatives that don't have this commercial backbone that can really be an advantage to bring your interest to the front. So that's also how I see a lot of initiatives to f in this area to fail, because they don't necessarily get... So, you know, as a community, we should really embrace these community projects and say, oh, look, these are not the same as the other commercial ones. These are the ones we should really support. But I often don't see that happening, because they would say, oh, we're all neutral. We don't embrace any of these. I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but maybe you can comment. In like a billion different ways. So, um, <laughs> so who has heard of the Berlin Open Science Community? Right, I mean, that seems like it could be important to figure out and join <laughs> for, like, for this. Um, building a community is not easy, right? Um, but I think one of the reasons why we've sort of not done so well about this in the past sort of seven or eight years is that we have been way too pragmatic about the way in which we approach whatever open science is. You know, it's like open access, open data, sharing your code, blah, blah, blah. It all seems like extra work to researchers, right? And this is why I've been trying this new sort of communication style based on actually, you know, what are the principles and the values behind this? Because, you know, again, I think all of you in this room and, you know, anybody else who I speak to about this shares these principles and these values. And it becomes much easier to build a community once you have that shared sense of commonality between you. Does that make sense? A little bit. You know, it's, it's just much easier. Um, building a community is not difficult, again. Like, you know, we've been here for four years in Berlin, and the fact that only three of you in this room have heard of the Berlin Open Science Community shows how difficult it is to do that. Although I think many of you are based outside of Berlin, right? Yeah, okay, fine. Um, the second point about, what's it? Um, 
about sustainable funding for communities. Is that sort of what you were poking at? Like, again, this is a big problem, like, right? you know, there's so much money being wasted on these big commercial publishers. Like, who knows how much we waste on subscriptions every year to publishers? One billion euro. Oh, yeah, okay, but that, oh, that's only, like, for five publishers in the EU. Yeah. Overall, it's like 25 US or billion US well, dollars. I, I yeah. Just in oh, it's far worse. It was just money coming out the European University. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, like, that's a lot of money, right? You could have 1% of that and just reinvest it in sustainable infrastructures and communities, and it could really sort of spark, like, these sort of grassroots campaigns. And thankfully, you know, some smart people are working on this right now. So, you know, there's a sustainable, Chris, what's the name? SCOS? Sustainable something, Scott. Open Science. Yeah, and they're starting to invest in sustainable infrastructures like um, like Sherpa Romeo and the Directory for Open Access Journals. And then recently, Spark uh, in North America, they announced a very similar initiative where they really want to start pumping money into communities and the infrastructures around them. So things are changing pretty fast at the moment. It's good to be part of that. Like, you guys are definitely all sort of riding the crest of the wave. Um, I don't really know what else to say about that. <laughs> Are there questions or comments or yes, Jonah? Yes, uh, I think there's a follow-up to um, what you both of you just said. So you're 100% uh, of the on the revolution side and zero percent on reform. I mean, God, like you know, that's getting into semantics, <laughs> and I don't really want to do that right now. Um, no, I mean, like we have been undergoing slow and steady evolution for the last 20, 25 years in the open space. And progress has been very slow, um, and it's been resisted on all sides. I think at some point, something a little bit revolutionary does need to happen. We saw Sci-Hub. That, I mean, the fact, like, just think about how crazy this is. The fact that all of the research is still of it is now freely available online, but that is illegal, and people still invest money into these broken systems, just shows you how difficult it is to catalyze change in this space. You know, I do think that... When we're talking about communities, sometimes evolution or slow reform can be better than, um, you know, complete overhaul of the system. But you know, the way I'm seeing it at the moment, there are so many bad actors within the sort of space that are resisting any form of change. That sometimes maybe we actually do need a bit of a shock to the system. I don't mean complete overhaul, but you know, this is a very complicated space with a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different social and technological interactions that I don't fully understand at all. Um, I just think we need to be able to be a little bit more strategic and thoughtful as a community into where are the sort of pain points and how can we alleviate them through strategic action at some point without putting people at risk again. No, no blood. <laughs> more comments, ideas, questions? No more blood. Just raise your hand. Yes, really? follow on from the previous two, um, I guess a good place to start would be with librarians. I mean, they are as embedded in the system as anybody, and they also are in charge of dangerous places. And there's a reason why people burn books, and librarians know how to get information out. Libraries are dangerous, they know how to deal with these things, they're full of good ideas. And so I would suggest if, if revolution isn't your thing and evolution is, then maybe talk to a librarian first. Is anybody else here a librarian? Can you put your hand up? There could be a, there's a record. There's no librarians? I'm jumping back. Oh my goodness, there's no librarians. I mean, I'm a librarian. Okay, well, thank you. Like, you are the unsung heroes of the entire open movement, right? Like, I believe this. Like, in the last few weeks, what I've been doing a lot of with the open science MOOC is contacting librarians, especially across Africa, saying, hey, how can we, like, support your growth? And we're like, oh my god, there are people who actually care about the things that we care about as librarians. Like, actually, yeah, there's quite a few of us. And also, they have no money. Yeah. They know how to do things with no money. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, I love it. Like, in the UK, we actually have a radical librarianship conference, and it's freaking brilliant. It's like this old view of, you know, shh, just read your books. is totally gone. Librarians are like, they're getting pissed off. And you know, it's fantastic. And I think, yeah, again, cross-stakeholder engagement between scientists, policymakers, and librarians needs to happen at some point, much, much more than it is now. I want to extend this to organizations like, for instance, Wikimedia. Obviously. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> librarians, it is, uh, they are providing this, this network, and of course we are talking, but this is, yeah, crucial. It's not just the librarians, they have mm -hmm. sometimes, I mean, I look in the library, and, I, um, and it, 
we change a lot because of this uh, partnering movement, like um, all this open science or open knowledge uh, communities. I never know how to get this right, but <laughs> that's what I'm to second this. I think Toby wanted to ask a little bit more. Yeah, again, I mean, because, um, I mean, of course, not everything is solved with librarians, but I think that that's already where we have seen most progress. But I know a lot of really engaged librarians, and this is why everybody's talking about open access. And in fact, it's starting to actually annoy me a little bit because there's so much more to open science than open access. And I perceive at most institutions that this is seen as an equal science. It's like, oh, yeah, we do all the open science because we have an open access group. Uh, and, and actually, I think, you know, there's also a lot more. So maybe I should change this graphic then and then for like librarians, researchers, policymakers, and like, you know, I mean, everyone who is sort of in this space, we do need to work together much more. And this is why I think spaces like this are fantastic. Just for that. So, yes, yes, yes. So, more comments, ideas, reactions? Yes? <laughs> yeah, I'm a guest here. I heard this for the first time or in this context. Um, I think it's a uh, what we are talking about is a more, not a global problem, or the, the attempt to resolve it is more like a Western program uh, approach or for the Westernized Western Hemisphere. Or the, because in, or it's for the tertiary education sector. So um, in most of the countries of the world, um, you have a student to teacher ratio of 1 to 60, and here you have 1 to 10, and other uh, most countries of the world you have completely different programs. This is what I thought when you listened to your presentation. So how do you actually want to make this a global movement? If uh, most of the globe has uh, probably a different uh, point of view. But this is what I assume. I, li I just heard that you said uh, I talked to librarians from Africa, so obviously you try to have a more global perspective, but what is it what you observe in this perspective? That's a really beautiful question. So, yeah, many of the problems which I were describing, I guess, were the sort of <laughs> like colonial in a lot of ways, right? You know, we have these capitalist scholarly publishing houses which are trying to impose their authority on global research communities. Um, and if you go to other places around the world, so a little question, who knows which country uh, publishes the highest proportion of open access papers out of any other? Brazil. Come on, Joe, you know this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm so sorry that you're on the spot. <laughs> it's Indonesia. And if you go to places like Latin America, they were doing open access as the sort of de facto norm across 15 different countries since we even came up with the term open access. And I was invited to a conference last year in Brazil and they asked me to tell them what can they do in South America to learn from what we're doing in Europe about how to progress open access. And I was just like, you've got it the wrong way around. It's like we're the ones who are failing and you're the ones who are actually the global leaders right now. And I think that's a very sort of difficult thing for a lot of people here in Western Europe to, to think. You know, if you think of Plan S, look at the sort of narrative that was being had around that. It's like, you know, we are the elite Western country, like Western European countries, and we are going to show you how to do open access properly. And then you go, well, honey, what you've been doing, they've been doing in Brazil for 25 years, and they haven't had this commercial influence, which you're still giving into. So, yeah, all around the world, there are very different things happening right now. You know, someone mentioned China. China produces a huge proportion of open access literature, and most of it's published in Chinese because they don't give a toss about you know whether you know North American can use their work. You know they're just sort of giving back what we've given them. Um, like it's a very complicated landscape, but you know what we're doing in Western Europe and in North America is certainly not the best that is happening around the rest of the world. And it's difficult to learn that unless you actually go to these places. I, I just wanted to add up on this. Um, so for your question, I think you're right, like research is being done in silos um, in many ways and many like non-Western world regions 
do their own research for their own local and regional challenges or like questions that they come up with and it stays there like they publish in very local or regional journals and never sees like there's no international or cross discipline cross regional exchange of knowledge but um, still most um, like better funded or like scientists that kind of want to engage internationally kind of see themselves forced to publish in high impact factors journals. So yes, it does affect them. And also whatever is being published behind paywalls very much affects their everyday life. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a very close connection, but yeah, to go into the details would really take a little longer than five minutes. But yeah. It's just a very important discussion to have. Just to expand on that, like you know, this is a really important thing. So only recently, and maybe three weeks ago, did this the begin to be any sort of global action on this level. So the uh, UNESCO decided to get um, organizations from Latin America, Japan, Southeast Asia, Africa, and uh, from the humanities sector in Europe rather than the STEM sector, and get them all together to build a global organization or initiative called GLOALL -L, or GLOAL or something. And that was exactly um, with the intention of what Joe was saying about increasing like the global sort of interconnectivity of these different research platforms and explicitly against these scholarly publishing houses which have been causing so much damage. And UNESCO are involved now. It's fantastic. It only took us 25 years to get them interested. So. Yes, first of all, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you as well for your talk. It was very inspiring. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, some concrete or more concrete ideas, brainstorming for the educational side of it. Because you talked about, okay, if there are any tenured professors in the room, you know, this is where you have to jump in. And I totally agree. I um, well, worked a little bit with this question, like how does doctoral education particularly need to change in order to prepare young scholars and young scientists for this type of environments? And what, what can we do? Like what needs to change at the institution itself? Because you also just mentioned that there's this high pressure to publish in pick journals and do this, and it's, it's really, really difficult to, I think, do this revolution or evolution, or whatever we want to call it, without putting ourselves in danger as young scholars. And I think this is a very important, you know, uh, point or, like, moment uh, where change needs to happen, and then the question is, who's going to be able to act out this change? Because it's very difficult for the young generation to do it, but what are the concrete steps that, you know, tenured professors, institutions, head of departments that they can take. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> yeah, because I wrote a paper on it. Um, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really, really good question again. It relates to this idea of strategic movement, right? You know, there's this first mover problem where everyone else thinks that everyone else is still maintaining the same system and doesn't want to be the first one to, to, uh, to, to move. Um, but in Germany in particular, there is a lot of change happening right now around this. So if you, there's um, Felix Schoenquart, at the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Mm -hmm. He maintains a database of um, research institutes in Germany, which explicitly now ask for open scientific practices within hiring um, applications, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Uh, here in Berlin, we have now the Quest Center, which is the first institute ever where it sort of dedicated itself to open research practices. And in fact, if you want to speak more about that, Mr. Hartgren oh, at the back would probably be happy to talk more. So things are changing, and I think what you mentioned about the risk is really, really, really important. And I'm still not entirely sure what the risks are, because you know, for example, people say that, oh, you know, I have to publish in a high impact journal, otherwise I can't progress my career. And it's like, okay, fine, but pretty much every single journal these days has a free self archiving option, so you can have your open access cake and your impact factor and have both. Like for example, did you know that both Nature and Science uh, have a six-month embargo period where your work is open access for free in PubMed Central anyway? Mm -hmm. So you can do both. Like there are many, many, many things that we can do. Many, so many in fact, that would be difficult to sort of name. But like I, I wrote this thing with a bunch of awesome people called the Foundations for Open Scholarship Strategy Development. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it contains actual concrete strategic steps that individuals research labs, institutions, and policymakers and librarians can all take to create a system-wide shift towards open scholarship. And it's a beast, and it's obviously freely available online. But like, that's a good place to start. 
it, you know, I know that institutes around the world are beginning to use it now to draft their own sort of open science policies. My, like the, the one bit of advice I've got again in this is like just be aware of the steps that you can take that don't put you at risk. And it's going to be very different for every single person in this room. And just for practical reasons available on your website, or what would be the fastest way to that? Mm, to what? To the paper. The paper you just uh, mentioned, or on the advice? Google. <laughs> Sorry? You can share it? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's, I can't even remember where this was published. <laughs> That's a really good question, I think. No easy answer. Um, so. Also to that, just a very short uh, remark. So Maria, Toby and I, we just uh, wrote like a blog entry also on to how to navigate the German um, institutions uh, in fostering open science. And um, yeah, that's going to come up in a few yeah. days. <laughs> Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, we're also happy to share that. Yeah. <laughs> nice One more out. over there, where? Yes. Make it nice. Thanks, John, for your talk. Uh, I, I just want to remind maybe everybody in the room also about the greater context of all this, because actually it's not only about open, yeah? I mean, it's about how we do science and how we... Uh, produce knowledge that will, uh, what you said, for the betterment of society. Yeah? And I think this whole idea of people not profits and how we can achieve this to, by standing together requires a, a, a specific set of skills. And I think I'm repeating myself. I might have said this here before, <laughs> but I need to repeat it like mantra, uh, mantra style. Um, because I think this skill set of collaboration on equal footing and on eyesight and on kind of um, working all together with the same materials is something we need to teach much better. And actually that's a, 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 a fun, foundational thing. And I think without those things, you can forget about open. And so I think, and this is often forgotten, you know. Now we teach the students of how can they can do open access or whatever, and how they can share the data on whatever repository, but we forget uh, the basic skills on collaboration. And I think that, that is really important. Sounds like you need some sort of open science MOOC. <laughs> <laughs> like what, one of the modules we're going to be developing is on open collaboration yeah. in the future. So, so I, thank you so much for that comment because that just reminded me of a second question I actually had. That I forgot when I asked my first question. Um, when we talk about access, right, and this was very much about, oh, I'm going to put a wrong word, but like the technical side of access, like how do you get access to the information. But when we talk about access in terms of you know, it's not just about finding the research, but it's also about understanding it and being able to understand it. And when we talk about the public good and making it accessible and, you know, for the betterment of society, um, I think this question of, like, how do we make it accessible for people who are not in the field is another really exciting one that we haven't really talked about. And maybe this is not the exact space for it, because I'm a guest and I don't really know. <laughs> but if it is, I would love to hear you take it. Bloody perfect. Yes, absolutely, 100% yes. Just because something is openly accessible available online does not mean that it's accessible to everyone to reuse. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, most of us here speak English, probably, hopefully, is a privilege, but a lot of other people in the world cannot. So the fact that most of our research is published in English makes it completely unusable for people. A fantastic example of this yeah. is when the uh, Zika outbreak was happening a couple of years ago, <laughs> most of the research being published on that was being shared and pu being published in English, shared on uh, platforms and geographic locations where English-speaking people dominated, and it was primarily Spanish and Portuguese communities who were being affected by this, and they just had nothing. So this is, a, yeah, this is so important. Like, we actually, 2012, it was, I actually led a panel discussion on that exact topic. It's like, hey, how is open access going to change the way in which we communicate science to the broader public? Honestly, people hadn't even like thought about it back then. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think access enables the uh, foundations for greater accessibility. So you can start to translate work, for example. You can start to write uh, non-specialist summaries for people. You can start to incorporate the policy documents. Without accessibility, uh, without access, there is no accessibility. But access does not automatically grant accessibility. And this is something again we need to be so aware of if we actually want to, be, you know start translating research into a way in which it's able to be reused. And I think there are several people who could talk about that way better than me. Cough, Andre. So. <laughs>
All right. I think um, with regards to the time, I would close it here, but I'm sure you stay a little bit around, or... I need a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, and there's an uh, ample of chance to talk to you um, later then, um, directly. Uh, with, um, yes, then first of all, let's say thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks.